right. Good morning, everybody. Let's stand up. We're going to worship. As um, everybody watching online, welcome as, as well. I want to tell you an incredible God story, okay? This is Emily, and she's, gonna, she's leading us in worship this morning. So let me tell you the story behind this. We met Emily yesterday at about 5 o'clock. So um, Janelle and I went out and got some lunch, went to a movie, and Christy, who normally leads worship, is on vacation seeing her family in Louisiana. So we had a, somebody else lined up to lead worship, practice with the, the band this week and everything, and due to some unforeseen circumstances, got a text at 5 o'clock that they weren't going to be able to lead worship. So I called about 10 people. Hey, can you bail us out tomorrow? We, we need somebody to lead worship, and it's Saturday night. And the place where Emily works, she was, she was there and uh, wait, waiting on us, and she overheard us talking about church, and she asked, Janelle, do you guys work for a church? We said, yes. And um, she said, well, I lead worship, and we told her our problem. She said, well, I lead worship, and we went, seriously. And <laughs> Showed her planning center, the songs, the keys, and she said, I'll be there first thing in the morning. Yeah. And um, remember last week when I preached about when the church prays? Yeah. God is legit, you know, and definitely first world problem there, but thank God for that. And Emily, thank you for coming here this morning and being with us, and we appreciate it. So thanks. Well, I also want to say that I've been at your church for maybe two hours, and I love it already. I can tell that just with working with our worship team and our AV booth and our pastors, like, you have a good place here. You've got a good home. Yeah. Let's for that. And I can tell that the love of God and the grace of God and just a welcoming presence is very evident here. So I'm very thankful to be here. Um, and the blessing goes the other way as well. So thank you for being with us today. We're going to go into some worship. And I also want to say that in weird Sundays like this, I feel like God can do something pretty amazing because when he disrupts our normal patterns in life, we are more focused or maybe more scared, maybe more fearful is what um, the right word is. But before we start singing, I want to invite you um, to close your eyes, whether you're online or in this room. Close your eyes and have your hands out with your palms up. This is a posture that we use when we're just ready to give up anything that we have um, to God, whether it's sadness, whether it's loneliness, whether it's fear, whether it's frustration or your mind is just racing. This is what we do. And I want to read this prayer to you before we get started so we can all just take a deep breath in a crazy weekend with graduations and parties and the end of the year. Let's all take a deep breath together today with our palms open as we release anything that we're holding on to that we don't need to. Lord, make me an instrument of your peace. Where there is hatred, let me bring love. Where there is injury, let me bring pardon. Where there is doubt, let me bring faith. Where there is despair, let me bring hope. Where there is darkness, let me bring light. Where there is sadness, let me bring joy. O oh, divine master, grant that I may not so much seek to be consoled as to console, to be understood as to understand, to be loved as to love. For it is in giving that we receive, and it is in pardoning that we are pardoned, and it is in dying that we are born to eternal life. Draw us into your love, Christ Jesus, and deliver us from fear. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forevermore. Amen. Let's sing together, guys. I was buried beneath my shame Who could carry that kind of weight 
It was my turn Till I met you You see, we were breathing I was breathing but not alive All my failures I tried to hide It was my turn Till I met you Here we go! You called my name And I ran out of that grave Out of the darkness Into your glorious day We say You called my name And I ran out of that grave Out of the darkness Into Into your glorious day oh. You called my name And I ran out of that grave Out of the darkness Into your glorious day Singing, I need a rest My sin was heavy Chains break out the weight of the glory I needed shelter I was an orphan But you called me a sin You called me oh When I was broken You were my healing Now your love is the air that I'm breathing I have a future My eyes are open Cause when you call my name If you want to dance, you are welcome to. I can just do the sprinkler. That's about it. <laughs> but let's all sing together. All right, we're singing. We stand. We stand and lift up our hands. For the joy of the Lord is our strength. Oh, we bow down and worship him. How great, how awesome is he, and together we
pray together. God, I thank you so much for your grace and your mercies that are new every morning. Thank you for your love and your light. And thank you for your holiness. God, with whatever we're carrying today on our shoulders, whatever anxiety we have, whatever doubt, whatever fear we have, may we just take a deep breath and let that go. We love you, and it's in your name we pray. Amen. Happy weekend, church. Thanks so much for spending some of your Memorial Day weekend with us. Thank you, Emily, for being in town, for, <laughs> for having no travel plans. Um, you know, it's, it's an honor to be up here today, um, in part because it means that Jill and Brian are finally taking some much-needed time off. That family has endured a year like no other. So I hope they are enjoying their time. For those of you who are online, I hope you're enjoying your time at home. My name is Carrie Johan. Thank you again for joining us. To be here on Memorial Day is really special for me. Um, many of you know I'm a veteran. I served in the United States Navy, and I'm here to tell you there is never a bad day or wrong day to tell a veteran thank you. I know many of you are out there in the crowd, and it's always okay to say thank you. But a veteran will also tell you it's not our day. Today is the day before Memorial Day, and just as the slide said, it might sound like it's a day off. There's mattress sales, uh, so, many, so many crazy things that they turn into this day. But ultimately, tomorrow is for a day of our brothers and sisters in arms who never took their uniform off. That might be somebody who was in a helicopter crash rendering aid in Nepal. It might have been a very young soldier who was in combat. The list can go on and on and on, but when I think about Memorial Day, there is one statue, one place in this country that I think of, and it's the Tomb of the Unknown Soldier. And I, I don't know why I think about that place as such a poignant moment in time, but if you haven't been, I will tell you a little bit about it. It is incredibly sacred to those who joined the military, who have been in, have been in the military. But what's even more interesting, what I love most about that spot is that engraved on the south side, there's three wreaths on each side, and engraved on the south side, it says, here rests in honored glory an American soldier known but to God. It's impressive to think that somebody who no one knew knows the one person who we all know. So this weekend, when you pray, when you think about your day off, genuinely think about those people who you don't know. It's not always this far-fetched battle, you know, 100 years ago. It's people who are here every day. So happy Memorial Day. That's my bit. We'll get into announcements, but thank you so much for sharing um, my, my emotions <laughs> with you today. So um, download the innovation. At, oh, thank you. <laughs> So if you want to follow along today or if you want to know what events are coming up, go ahead and download the Novation app. 
you can see everything that's coming. We've got some really fun events coming up, and we also do sermon notes that are online that you can take notes and follow along there. Our next event that you'll see coming up on the app is the Men's Core Gathering. That's this coming Saturday at 8 a.m. Gentlemen, come out. Come fellowship with each other. Meet your neighbors. Spend some time in the Word, getting to know each other. It's really a cool time. It's pretty casual. They bring in, I believe, breakfast burritos and coffee right here into the sanctuary. We would love to have you there. You can also meet all those men to put on your team for the Novation Open. <laughs> Find folks, ask them what's their good game. Maybe they're a good driver. I drive the golf cart really well. That's about where I finish my game, so I don't play in it. Um, but put together a foursome, or if you want to play solo, we can find a foursome for you. If you're a business and you want to partner with us, we would love to have you sponsor a whole. We would get your name out there. Just let Janelle or somebody in the info booth know that we would love to see you June 6th. That's this coming Sunday is the last day to register. Make sure you do that. Finally, events. Picnic in the park this summer. Right? So many people were so excited about this. This is a really kind of an unorganized thing. All we did was put out a date and time. Alicia and Joel Dennis, thank you for doing this. So many people are like, we're going to the park together. You could have done that all year. But we're doing it together now. <laughs> and it's organized. So June 9th is our first one down at Faversham Park. Did I pronounce that right? Um, so bring out your own chairs, your own meal, your own cooler, and come fellowship with the rest of our church, and let's have a really good time. We have somebody coming to the stage to talk. I'm surprised he's not here. He is. This is Mark Bullion. He's our youth minister. He's going to chat about the kids here. I'm getting booed on stage. I don't understand that. It's usually off stage they boo. If I have not had the opportunity to meet you, I am Mark Bullion. I'm the associate pastor for Novation Church. For those of you online, that's you. Um, oh. I, uh, my, today, I get the opportunity to have the microphone and for a few minutes, and I want to highlight our youth ministry. Um, youth ministry in this church is amazing. It's very, very vibrant, and it continues to grow. And I think I may have shared this at one time, but nearly half of our kids who come to youth group, and we're running around 30 to 35 kids uh, a Sunday night, but half of those kids don't even attend church here. Their families don't. And some of you ponder that a little bit and why that is. I've had to sit back at, on Sunday nights going, why do these kids come when they don't even come to our own church? And it's, I, there's nothing about, I don't care where they go to church. I'm just grateful they go to church. But they're coming at the request of their friends. They're coming at, I, I'm, I'm hoping at the prompting of the Holy Spirit. You guys have seen the Foursquare box outside. We'll play a little Foursquare afterwards if you want to do that too. So my kids are amazing, these, these students. And I just wanted to highlight something we did last weekend. If you look up on the screen, we had our very first prom. Now, a lot of our kids ha are homeschooled, and they, their prom got wrecked. They, what they were planning on doing just did not come to fruition. So the leadership and I, we put together a prom for them here in the building. We went from 8 to midnight. And we had a blast. We had almost 30 only high school kids show up. And we had over 600 balloons on the floor where you're sitting right now. You should have been here when we popped them all at the end. That was a lot of fun. But you can just see this was our masquerade. And, and we, we used the mask as our backdrop because we were in the midst of COVID and now we're coming out of it. But one thing that the kids did say, can we do this again next year? And we've never done this. So I'm going to have to talk to Janelle about my budget, and we're going to keep moving this thing forward because they loved it, and they had so much fun. Josh was part of it, um, and I have a couple of um, other kids that are in here that I'm going to ask to come up right now. Um, not only is our youth ministry vibrant, but um, come on, kids. Megan and Cade, come on. Josh, step away from the... I was going to try. Stand over there next to him. All right. Three graduating seniors this year. They've graduated, and now life presents to them what, what's going to be next. So I wanted to give them the microphone and allow them to tell you who they are and what their plans are for the, you know, maybe the next six months to a year, what God, and what God's doing in your life. So introduce yourself. 
Uh, and you'll see up on the screen who these individuals are. Actually, you can see them. Yeah, <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> All right, tell us, Josh. So my name's Josh. Uh, little fun fact about me, I play the piano, so just, just a little fun fact. But I'm still not 100% sure where I'm going in life. I am considering maybe taking a gap year, maybe considering going to MSU in Denver to pursue something like accounting or mathematics. I haven't fully decided yet, but I do know that wherever I do go, I want to make sure that I'm following God still and doing all that good stuff. <laughs> I'm Megan Dormish. Uh, I might take general education classes at Front Range because I'm broke. Yeah. And, <laughs> and I don't know what I want to major in yet, so I'll get all the cheap <laughs> classes out of the way. <laughs> uh, my, uh, my name is Cade Bullion. <laughs> Uh, as you can tell, that's my dad right there. <laughs> uh, I'm going to go to the University of Sioux Falls, and I'm, gonna, I'm planning to run cross-country and track for them, and I'm planning to study exercise sciences. And yeah. Apparently, there's a favorite here. I just wanted to point that out. There's no favoritism on stage. <laughs> to be perfectly honest, I've known the Dennis family. I've known um, Josiah over here on whatever a musical instrument that is. Um, that's why they didn't ask me to lead worship today. <laughs> um, I've known him in the womb, and I've known him in the womb. So I've actually grown up with these kids with me all the time. I can't tell you how proud I am of these seniors. And their love for God runs deep. I can't explain that in any other words. These guys serve him wholeheartedly wherever they go. And I know without a shadow of a doubt, whatever, whatever you're going to do, whether you know it or not, God is orchestrating some great things for all three of you guys. And I am excited to see you guys leave, number one. But then I'm also going to be excited to see you come back and to tell us in a leadership role what God's been doing and helping to raise up our brand new sixth graders who are coming in in, in the ways of what's happening. So... I know that God's got great things. So what I'd like to do is I would like to pray for these three seniors. And if you would, just extend a hand to them. And we're going to pray just blessings over them. Father, I'm so grateful for each one of these students. I love them like they're my own kid. Well, one of them is. But Lord, they're your kids first and foremost. And as a dad, you have provided a way for them to move forward in whatever, the, whatever way you see fit. And Lord God, as these guys go forward, would you open up their hearts and extend that love that's in there to the people that they're going to be with? Lord, would you navigate their educational steps if that's where you lead them to go? But more than anything, would you lead them spiritually, deeper with you? I pray that each one of these guys would make an impact in this world, Father God, starting at birth, and continuing forward, Lord God. Put your hand of mercy over them in grace. Keep them safe as they move forward. And just remind them on a daily basis that you are their God. You are their Abba. You are their Father. They can trust you. They can lean on you. You're our all in all. We love you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Give them one more big hand. And believe it or not, all three of them have a graduation party today. So, hey. Thank you guys so much. So, uh, I know. That was so sweet. Um, <laughs> thank you, Mark, so much. Really what this gentleman does for so many kids. He came to me today and he said, children's ministry is so important to me because kids bring parents to church. And how many adult kids? Bring your parent to church. I know there's some, yep, I know there's some, some parents, some, oh, some older kids that bring even older parents to church, and that's just part of what it is. So it's kind of a, kind of a, a never-ending thing. Um, to keep children's ministry alive, it is not possible without your generosity. So I thank you so much for partnering with us on that. 
Um, if you are compelled to give to Novation Church, we would love for you to do so. There is an offering box as you exit the sanctuary. You can also give right on your app. If maybe you're compelled just to give to children's ministry, you're welcome to do that. You can give into a specific ministry here in the church, or you can give generally, and we will certainly use those funds to not only bless our church, but to bless the community around us. So thank you so much for joining us again this Memorial Day weekend. Congratulations to those seniors. We're going to pray real quick, and we'll get Emily back up here on stage to finish her time with us. Lord, thank you so much for such a holiday. It's an opportunity for us to share our love with families who may be grieving so deep. We would like you to wrap your arms around every service member who is on home soil and abroad, and we pray that you bring every one of them home. Allow each of them to know the joy of homecoming and to hug their family again. We know that this weekend is going to be a time for us to relax, but let's never forget that you give us every day, rainy or sunny, Memorial Day or not, every day is a day that you have given us that we can wake up and we can praise you and worship you for the life that you have for every one of us in this room, and we cannot thank you enough for that. So we thank you so much for your presence here today. I can feel it. It's wonderful. It's joyful, and we look forward to a wonderful service. Amen. If you'd like to stand up with us, you can. If you want to sit down, you can as well. Whatever you'd like. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, your perfect love is casting out fear. And even when I'm caught in the middle of the storms of this life, I won't turn back. I know you are near. And I will fear no I'm 
song to sing together and um, as we've had practice and as um, I've just been experiencing what it looks like to worship with you all I had kind of a connection in my brain Um, so I work at a place where I serve um, people and I hear a lot of their stories Um, I hear about things that have happened in their lives that they don't know what to do about Um, I've heard of um, their family members who are going through addictions. I've heard of a lot of tragedy and a lot of joy. And I think as I reflect on just this whole experience and how it's happened, um, one of the things that is different between me and the person who I serve in a general um, consensus is that a lot of the people who I talk to each day, they don't seem to have a lot of hope a lot of hope in a God who is bigger than they are, a God who knows their circumstance and knows them on a personal level, a God who loves them for who they are, not um, because of what they've done or what's been done to them or who they are as a person, but because of just that he made them, that he loves them, that he cares for them, that he took time in creating them. And that this person that's on the other side of my work, they're telling me about their issues and they don't seem to have hope. And that lack of hope, just experiencing that feeling, it feels like there's so much weight that's on me. But I remember while we're in this room together, that if you are a believer, you do have hope. And no matter how big or small it may seem right now, there is this hope and this yearning for God, this yearning for goodness, this yearning for holiness that is available to you and to me. And I think no matter how similar or different we are from each other, we have this connection in this hope that we have as an anchor for the soul. As we sing this next song, would you just think about that? If you're a believer, think about this hope that you may or may not have in this moment and this potential hope that you can experience today. If you're not a believer, I would like to invite you to just think about what that hope could mean for you. Let's reflect on this together and let's sing this song. sorrow and dead in my sin lost without hope with no place to begin your love made a way to let mercy come in when death was arrested and my life began ash was redeemed only beauty remained
Thank you for loving us. Thank you for giving us hope. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Y'all can have a seat. Better turn this on, huh? Good morning. Good morning. It is a gorgeous day. Um, praise God. I love the sunshine. Oh, I'm, I, I mean the rain. Yeah, that's, that's good too, right? Uh, it, it's good to be a part of a family, a community of believers that care for one another, share life with one another. Um, it's good to be here with, with all of you. For those that are watching online, great to have you. Um, if, if we haven't met, my name is Scott. I'm the other Scott, okay? <laughs> I'm the Scott they bring up once in a while to teach so that you really, really are excited when Pastor Scott comes back, <laughs> okay? So <clears throat> um, as, as most of you will know, we've, we are in a series called Kingdom Go. Now, now this series is going through the book of Acts, 
And prior to that, we went through the book of Luke, talking about the kingdom come. When, when Christ came to earth, he proclaimed that the kingdom had come. The kingdom of God had come. And now the book of Acts, we're looking at kingdom go. How did the church mobilize then? How do we mobilize now? What does it look like to go and to share? And I've got to tell you, um, Pastor Scott gave me chapters 13 and 14 and wanted me to cover that in like 25 minutes. Are you ready for this? <laughs> and I really wrestled with that. I'll be honest, I struggled for, for a couple weeks, like what am I supposed to do? And, and, and so my heart's prayer to God was, what do you want to tell me about these two chapters? And what do you want to tell my family about these two chapters? And he began to work in me some things. So we're going to look at an overview. We're not going to do this detail thing through the chapters so much, a little bit of that. But I, I want you to know right up front that these lights are great because I can't see any of you. So, so just know there is a huge mirror right here. And I'm talking to myself. And if God stirs your heart while I'm talking to myself with what God's been talking to me about the last couple of weeks, then praise God. It's a win. So, Father, we, we come to you right now. And, and Father, we pray in, in, in your son Jesus' name that your will would be accomplished, that your purposes would be accomplished in the hearts of your people today. And we also continue to pray for those families that didn't have their veterans return. Comfort their hearts this weekend specifically. Guard their hearts. Give them your peace and overshadow them with your love in Jesus' name. <clears throat> Amen. Okay, short story. Back when I was a sophomore in high school, picture that, okay? Hair, <laughs> thin waistline, eh, not really. Anyway, I was a sophomore in high school, and a friend of mine, his name is Danny, we decided to go out and, and have fun on a late October night. I think it was called Halloween. Um, and of course, we got in trouble. Um, we decided at one point it would be just a great idea to take a few dozen eggs and, and get the principal's house. <laughs> Disclaimer, people, do not egg homes or cars. Evelyn, never, ever. <laughs> it destroys paint, okay? So anyway, we got in trouble. I won't go into all the details because it takes too long. But the, the next school day, as was the custom, Danny walks to my house because I had the car so we could drive to school, 1950, flathead six, three on the tree, Ford, primer gray. Bought it myself, $110, did that tell you a little bit about it, okay? But before we got to school, Danny and I decided to heck with it, we're going to run away from home, we're headed to California because we don't need this stuff. We don't need all these people watching over us. So um, being naive, we didn't know where we were going, we ended up that night in Cheyenne, Wyoming, that's where the car broke down. <laughs> and uh, we spent the night in the car. I do remember it was extremely cold. And the next morning, we hear this little tap, tap, tap on the glass of the car. And we look up, and there's a police officer. He was gracious enough to take us to his facilities and put us in a room. I thought, how nice. <laughs> pocket and turn it off. And, and three days later, he was gracious enough to come down and open the door <laughs> and take us out to the, the front office, and there our dads were. <laughs> yeah. Here's what I want you to get. Our dads were compelled to come get us. They were compelled to put gas in a car, drive for hundreds of miles, take time off work. They were compelled to come get us and take us home. I like to think they were compelled out of love. <laughs> Could have been anger. <laughs> Could have been embarrassment. But they were compelled. And that's the word I want you to grasp today. If you get nothing else out of this message today, I want you to grasp that word compelled. Okay? Because the, the, the overarching view, view of what we're looking at in the book of Acts is kingdom go. But today I want you to grasp compelled. Okay, um, And so, so as God was stirring this in my heart, 
and, and saying, okay, what are, what are you telling me, God? What do you want to tell us? Um, an, another story of, of being compelled came to mind, and that was Isaiah back in Isaiah 6. If you remember, he was in the temple. He was in the presence of God, and he goes, whoa, it's me. I'm unclean. I'm a man of unclean lips. I'm, 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 I'm terrible. And then the angel of the Lord came down and touched the hot coal to his lips and said, your, your guilt is taken away. You have been atoned for. Your sin has been atoned for. And then he heard a voice of the Lord saying, whom shall I send and who shall go for me? And Isaiah was compelled to say, here am I, send me. Here am I, send me. Compelled. So we see that same, same process in, in the first couple chapters of, of the, um, excuse me, in the first couple verses of chapter 13, um, much like Isaiah was compelled, in verses 2 through 5 of Acts 13, it says, while they were worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. And then after fasting and praying, they laid their hands on them and they sent them off. Okay, so picture this. It's a church service, yeah, kind of like this, right? They're praising God. They're worshiping. And, and as they're in the presence of God, the Holy Spirit says, set apart for me Barnabas and Saul and send them off, okay? So this is a great missionary message, of course, but you've got to stop and think if that happened today in this church, in this, in this, this building, and two of our leaders. Here's what I want you to get. Barnabas and Saul were key leaders in that church. They were prophets. They were teachers. And the church was ready to send off their very best to go do what God called them to do and support them in that. That's a big thing right there. So Saul, I love Saul. He's a man after my own heart. Oh, that was King David. Sorry. What can I say? You know, I sometimes just kind of go haywire. No, but, but I, I do like Saul. You got to remember, we, we looked at Saul. Pastor Scott was talking about Saul earlier um, in, in the series. And, and one of the things that we remember about Saul was he held the cloaks, the coats, when Stephen was stoned. Stephen was, was preaching the gospel. Saul was against the gospel. He held the coats, which basically said, I'm in favor of this. Stone him. And then he asked for letters so that he could ravage the church because he was anti-Christian. He wanted nothing to do with Christ. And then Pastor Scott also shared about the road to Damascus, miraculous conversion of Saul. All right? So we see this man who, who used to be a non-believer fighting the church, and now he's a believer. But here's what I want you to understand. This didn't just happen yesterday. Barnabas and Saul are now being called out. Saul's conversion was over a decade ago. I mean, it was just a few chapters, right, in the book of Acts, but it was over a decade ago. There's been a lot that has gone on during that process of him learning from the Lord and from the disciples. And, and Barnabas, this is what I'm, I want to point out. There's little mini teachings all through this stupid thing. I'm sorry. But Barnabas <laughs> latched on to Saul because Saul came back to Jerusalem after he'd spent years learning of the Lord, and he came back to the, to the disciples saying, I want to be a part of you. I, I'm walking in faith now. I want to be with you. And they said, oh, no way. We don't believe you. We don't think you're a disciple. And, I, and this is what I like to picture. Barnabas putting his arm around Saul and bringing him to the disciples and saying, this is a man walking in faith. We need to embrace him and bring him into our community. So Barnabas and Saul are called out, but their ties have been going on for a long time. There's strength of being together. And, and what I want to talk about there is just that, that community of believers. God didn't place you where you're at today. He didn't place me where I'm at today by happenstance. There's people in my life that, that God wants to, to form strong ties with so that we can promote the gospel of Christ together. And we see that in this church. We see people that were grown up together promoting the gospel of Christ. I just love that. And so as I was wrestling with, okay, God, am I supposed to preach a missionary message? And all of a sudden, God just revealed to me another passage that really brought this home, and that's Matthew 28, 19. Therefore, to the whole church, therefore, go, 
Make disciples of all nations. Therefore, go. And, and we use that a lot also to send missionaries out. But, but, but kingdom go is not just about sending missionaries. That's great. Don't get me wrong. I'm all about that. But it's also to let us know that we are all missionaries. I'm a missionary. I'm an ambassador of Christ. That, that phrase, therefore, go, if translated properly, really means as you go. It's not just, you know, as you go, kicking people out to other countries. It's as you go. As I go about my life, as I go about my day, as I go about my week, make disciples. As I go through my life. And that, that sheds a whole nother light on it. And, and so this is for all of us. And I do believe, and our home group's been talking about this, I do believe there are paths that God directs us down. <clears throat> and so how do, we, how do we hear God's voice? And so I go back to how did Isaiah hear God's voice? How did Barnabas and Saul hear God's voice? They heard his voice when they were in his presence. And that's a whole other message. How, how, what does it mean to be in the presence of God? Our home group talked about that last week. It was, you know, it was great. But what does that mean, and, and what does that look like? But that's where we hear his voice. <clears throat> so really, honestly, if you don't want to hear his voice, if you don't, know, don't want to know what, what path he has for you, stay on the fringe. Just stay way out there, and don't get in his presence, and you'll never know. How's that for blunt? <laughs> that's what God spoke to me. Are you on the fringe? That's what he asked me. I'm not kidding. This message really, really stirred my heart. So why is it important? What is so important about proclaiming the gospel of Christ? What is so important? Um, there has to be. There is this compelling purpose. There's that word again. There is this compelling purpose. We see a call, but now there's a compelling purpose. It says in 1338, let it be known to you, therefore, brothers, that through this man, Christ, forgiveness of sins is proclaimed to you, and by him, everyone who believes is freed from everything from which you could not be freed by the law of Moses. And again, the law, if you didn't know, the law shows us our brokenness. It shows us our sin, but it can't fix us. Jesus took the punishment that's rightfully mine on the cross and died in my place to atone for my sins. That's pretty compelling, all right? Salvation, redemption, the saving of, of human beings from death and separation from God for eternity. That's what salvation is. Salvation brings a reconciliation so that we are reconciled to God for eternity versus being outside of his presence for eternity. Now, that's a pretty compelling purpose, I think. And God, again, was stirring that up in my heart. Am I compelled to know the truth of that message? That with, without being connected, without being being, being able to receive the gift of, of, of Christ's love and salvation and hope and breaking us from, from the sins that we're in is going to also keep me outside of the presence of God for eternity. Is, is that something that resonates on my heart? That should compel me to be able to, to move forward and to proclaim the gospel. And the Bible specifically says, without any possible interpretation, that there's one way to God. There's one faith. There's one God the Father, and the only way through him, to him, is through his son, Jesus Christ. His sacrificial death on the cross, his subsequent resurrection from the grave. That is the way to be reconciled to God. And, and I've got to say, you know, how many of you know there's really nothing new under the sun? There really isn't. We struggle with the same things in our society that they struggled with way back when. But I really do believe that there's a bombardment at this time in our lives of false teachings, false religions, rising up. And, and many people have these itching ears to hear something that sounds good. 
that sounds like, you know, hey, I, I, I kind of like that, okay? Um, but I want to read some scriptures, and, and I can't, boy, I had a bunch of them, so I had to, this is where I had to whittle down. I told, I told the pre-service, um, or I don't know what they call it. What are you guys when you put the service together? Meeting. I, meeting. Oh, thank you, Steve. <laughs> I told the people, <laughs> gosh, I love you, Steve. I told the people in the pre-meeting of the service, I said, when I first put this message together, it was 55 minutes long. I said, I would never get through that. I'd fall asleep myself. Okay? <laughs> but a lot of that was because I found so many fantastic scriptures talking about the truth that it's only through Christ. But I'm going to read a, a few of them here. Acts 4.12 says, Nor is there salvation in any other, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. 1 Timothy 2.5 says, For there is one God... One mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself a ransom for all. John 14, 6, Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. John 3, 15, 16, which all of us know and love. For God so loved the world that he gave us only begotten son, his only son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. And John 5, 24 says, most assuredly, I say to you, he who hears my word and believes in him who sent me has everlasting life, shall not come into judgment, but has passed from death to life. It is only through Christ. There's one way to the father. And that is a compelling reason, a compelling purpose for us to be missionaries and ambassadors for the gospel of Christ because it is the only way that people outside of the kingdom of God will be able to be reconciled with their heavenly Father for eternity. For eternity. Think about that. You see, outside of, of accepting that gift, and that's all it is, it's just accepting the gift that Christ gave, the gift of salvation, the gift of him taking upon himself our punishment, outside of that, people will spend an eternity outside of a relationship with their Heavenly Father. There is, there is so very, very much more to this life than what we see with our physical, finite eyes. Now, I don't know about you, but I have a hard time, some, I really do, I have a hard time sometimes understanding eternity. Well, I mean, how do you understand eternity? Outside of my physical body, who would want to get rid of this? Okay, Joel, right? Who would want to get rid of this physical body? But, but eternity is not finite. It, it's infinite, and we have to grasp that. I have to grasp that. God was hammering me for the last two weeks. Do you realize that these people in your space, that these people that you work with, that these people that you see, if they don't accept this gift, are going to be outside of a, re a reconciled relationship with me for eternity? Does that ring in your heart, Scott? That's what God's been speaking to me the last couple of weeks. And again, there's this mirror, okay? My wife says sometimes when I'm passionate, I get a little harsh. Forgive me if that comes across. But I'm passionately speaking to myself. It's pretty compelling. Definitely a calling. And I think what we just looked at through the book, chapters 13, some of those verses out of... Uh, um, about also about Christ and, and him being the only way to God the Father. That's a pretty compelling purpose for us to go out and share what God's done for us, testify, witness what he's done for us, which is really all, all we're supposed to do, right? Now, the third part, and this is the part I really like, there may be, no, no, there will be conflict. There will be opposition, and we see that we're going to look at some instances uh, that, that Barnabas and Saul had, but there will be conflict. And how, do, how, do, how is that handled? How, how do I handle rejection? How do I handle maybe not being the most popular person at work because, because I'm, I'm talking about Christ and people don't want to hear that? Now, I, I, a caveat on that is, is I, we, we have to strive to be non-offensive. We, we don't want to offend people. We want to talk to them 
uh, with love and kindness and care, it's not like we're out there, I'm not saying we, we go out there and pound the gospel into people's brains because we don't. We want to do it in a loving, kind way. But the gospel in and of itself can be offensive. It can be offensive to somebody living outside of the kingdom of God. What, you're telling me I'm broken? You're telling me that I'm, I'm bound up with sin? I love, Emily talked about being freed from sin. I'm bound up. I'm broken. I, there's sin in my life. What does that mean? <laughs> defense, 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 right? Okay? So we have to be very careful about how we, we talk to people. And yet we have to be compelled to share the truth. Compelled to the point we see in Barnabas and Saul to endure physical pain. Not just being unpopular, they, they got hurt. We see in the early church martyrs of people who were put to death for the gospel of Christ. Why? Because the message is extremely important. There's that compelling purpose again. So we're going to look at some conflicts, maybe some of the ways they handled the conflict. It says in chapter 13, verse 7 through 10, a man of intelligence who summoned Barnabas, and it wasn't me, just to tell you that, a man of intelligence who summoned Barnabas and Saul and sought to hear the word of God, but Elimus, the magician, for that is the meaning of his name, opposed them, seeking to turn the proconsul away from the faith. But I love this. But Saul, who was called Paul, stands up and just blasts him and says, basically, get out of my way. Okay, filled with the Holy Spirit, looked intently at him and said, you son of the devil, will you not stop making crooked the straight paths of the Lord? Get out of my way. This person summoned me to hear the truth of the gospel, and you will not stand in my way. Okay? <sighs> Mini message. It says Saul, who was also called Paul. And Pastor Scott mentioned this a couple weeks ago too, but Paul's Jewish name was Saul which meant asked for, sought after. Think back to King Saul when the Jewish people wanted a king. They asked for that king. That was his Hebrew name. <clears throat> his Greek name, Latin name, was Paul. And Pastor Scott pointed out that means small, little. And so you see this, this switch from I'm somebody to I'm dependent on you. All right. But what I really want to bring across here, not so much that is, I, I've, heard, I've heard teachings about how I could get in trouble. Oh, turn the mic off, guys. Uh, um, I could, I've heard teachings about how Saul was his pre-conversion name and Paul was his conversion name. But we found out earlier that Saul has been living a life of faith for over a decade, and he's still been called Saul. This is the first time in Scripture that he's called Paul, and it's the last time in Scripture that he's called Saul. So why? Why? I think it's significant. That's why I'm bringing it up. If we look down in verse 45 and 46, it says, But when the Jews saw the crowds, they were filled with jealousy and began to contradict what was spoken by Paul, reviling him. And Paul and Barnabas spoke out loudly, saying, It was necessary that the word of God be spoken first to you, the Jewish people. And since you've thrust it aside and judge yourselves unworthy of eternal life, that's a strong message right there. I can't go into it, don't have time. Behold, we're turning to the Gentiles. This is the point where Saul is now turning the bulk of his ministry to the Gentiles. And I believe this name switch was intentional by Paul to fit in a little better with the culture that he was going to talk to. I mean, wasn't it Paul who made the comment, I'll become all things to all men, thereby I may win some? Now, we may never go to another country and have to understand the culture of that country. But I guarantee you, my workplace culture is different than your workplace culture. And what, what is, is God telling me I may need to do in my work culture to get them to receive what I have to say a little bit better. I'm not saying you go live their lives, lifestyles, you go party. I'm not, don't go down that road. But what I am saying is there's some things that we have to be able to lay down and pick up and maybe switch in our vocabulary or thought processes to be better relatable to the people that we're talking with. So again, I, I believe this was an intentional switch by Paul to specifically fit in a little bit better with the culture that he was going to start talking to. Acts 13, 50 
51 it says, But the Jews incited the devout women of high standing and the leading men of the city stirred up persecution against Paul and Barnabas and drove them out of their district. Again, we're looking at conflicts that happen. So, so now they're being driven out. They're, they didn't want to hear the truth of the gospel. So in this instance, it says, uh, Barnabas and Paul shook off the dust from their feet against them and went on to Iconium. You ever want to just do that? <laughs> Shake off your dust, you know? What that basically means is we're no longer responsible for you. We're no longer responsible for you. It, it's much like you saw with Pilate when they brought Christ before Pilate. And at one point, he symbolically went over, got a basin of water, and washed his hands. He said, I wash my hands of this matter. It's on you. And that's the same, same principle. And, and I bring this up because I think that's a really strong message for us today. It's a strong message for any missionary. It's a strong message for any ambassador. It's a strong message for any Christian. It's not my duty to debate somebody to accept Christ. It's not my duty. My duty is not to, to go out and try to convert somebody. It's my duty to bear witness to the truth of how the gospel has affected me and freed me and reconciled me with my heavenly father. And the gospel is there to reconcile you to your heavenly father as well. So we're to bear witness and then the big part is we're then to disciple those who do make that decision. That's our big, our big push, is to make disciples, to teach, to train, to give people a place to learn, to grow, to be safe as they grow. Because none of us go from A to B just like that. It's a process. We proclaim the truth of the gospel. The Holy Spirit will draw them in. To, okay? Acts 14, 4 through 7. We see that the people of the city were divided. Some sided with the Jews, others with the apostles, and there was a plot afoot among both Gentiles and Jews, together with their leaders, to mistreat them and stone them. This is me. But they found out and ran. <laughs> I'm getting out of here. It says they found out about it and they fled. They fled that city and went to Lystra and Derby to the surrounding country where they didn't leave their message or their mission. It says where they continued to preach the gospel. They didn't quit their mission. They just went someplace where it might be received better. Sometimes that happens. We have to be okay with that. Okay? And then it says in Lystra where they went to, there was a man who was lame. I love this because he'd been lame from birth. He listened to Paul, and at one point Paul looked at him and said, stand up on your feet. And this man miraculously stands up. He's been lame since birth. Fantastic miracle happened, okay? Man. And it says when the crowd saw what Paul had done, they started shouting, the gods have come down. And, and they wanted to, they wanted to um, bring sacrifices to them and wanted to worship them as gods. And Barnabas and Paul, it says, they heard this and they tore their clothes and they shouted, why are you doing this? We're just men. We're just men. Why are you doing this? And I pinpointed this one because I have seen in my life, now just so you guys will know, I, I begin my faith walk in 19... <coughs> <laughs> and so I've been walking this walk for a while. I've seen a lot of things and, and one of the things that I've seen, and maybe you've seen it too, but you see this mighty move of God through a specific ministry or a specific person, and all of a sudden, the, it starts welling up. Wow, look at me. Look what God is doing through me. And that pride begins to well up. And I'm here to tell you, pride diminishes the gospel, all right? It really, really does. We're supposed to walk in humility. Again, think of Paul's Greek meaning, Greek's name's meaning, little. Okay? He was dependent upon the Spirit of God to do the work. Again, that's a little bit of a side note, but, but I thought it was important to, to, to point out. But here's what I really like about this passage. What, do you think people are fickle? I'm, really? I mean, come on. Fickle? I'm, I'm steadfast. I know where I'm going. Come on. The fickleness of people, I just love it, because after this happened, these people were worshiping them as gods. 
And then it says some Jews came down from Antioch and Iconium. Remember, this is where they ran from. This is where they, they fled from. Those people followed them to do damage to their ministry. It can happen, okay? So they followed them. I lost my place. Where am I? Boom, boom, boom. And won the crowd over. And they stoned Paul. And they dragged him outside the city thinking he was dead. Now, I don't know about you, but I don't want to be stoned. But Paul was so compelled to do what God asked him to do that he allowed that. I mean, he didn't allow it, but he walked into that. He just, okay, this is part of it. And, and, and verse 20, here's, I just love this. But it says, after the disciples had gathered around Paul, who had been stoned supposedly to death, he got up and went back into the city. Yeah. Now, whether he was dead or not, Scripture really doesn't say. But if he wasn't dead, he was pretty close to it. So whatever way you look at it, this was a miraculous event that happened in his life. He got up, went back in the city. And the next day, he and Barnabas left for Derby, where they preached the gospel in that city and one large number of disciples. They kept moving forward. They never let anything push him back. If you don't want to hear it, I'll shake the dust off my feet. If you try to resist me, I'll tell you to get out of my way because they want to hear the gospel. If you stone me and beat me, that's okay. I'll go someplace else and I'll preach the gospel. Can you imagine <laughs> having that compelling drive to just keep moving forward, all right? And then after that, it says they returned to Lystra, Iconium, and Antioch. So they backtracked. So they've, they've been on this missionary journey. They've gone through all these towns. They've proclaimed the gospel. People have come to faith. Little, little communities of faith have sprung up. And then they backtrack. And, and then it says in verse 22, strengthening the disciples and encouraging them to remain true to the faith. Making disciples. First pass through. People came to faith. Second pass back, let's put some infrastructure together. What can we do to make sure that you get taught? What can we do? What can we put in place? This is where they, they, they'd sometimes put, you know, put in place elders and pastors, and they'd build little communities of faith so that these conversions, these people who have come into faith, have some place to grow. Because I'm going to tell you right now, the initial response is nothing if there isn't a garden for them to grow in, all right? So we see that they, they went out, they spread this good news. It wasn't always received well. That's a little bit of an understatement. But there had to be that compelling reason for them to do that. There has to be that compelling reason for me. And this is, again, what God was stirring in my heart. Am I compelled? Am I compelled? Is the gospel so powerful to me, that I can't help but share it with those around me? Is the gospel so important to me to understand that anybody outside of Christ will spend eternity outside of a relationship with their Heavenly Father? Man. I don't want to step on toes, but I'm going to do this anyway. I didn't know if I was, but God really brought something to mind to me. I love the <clears throat> the two greatest commandments which, which cover everything. What are they? You know them, right? Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all your heart, your mind, your spirit, your soul. And thou shalt love your neighbor as yourself. Love, compassion, care. I'm all about that. But what God shared with me, and again, <laughs> here, this is the mirror, okay? What God really shared with me over the last couple of weeks is do I love them enough to share the gospel of Christ with them? Do I love them enough to let them know that they've got a heavenly father that loves them and wants to free them from sin and wants to spend eternity with them in a reconciled relationship? Or do I just love them enough to go shovel the snow off their driveway? And again, this is my mirror, okay? Because the gospel, as we saw in, in 13 and 14, isn't always received well. Christ came proclaiming the kingdom of God and they crucified him. Why? Because it was a major shift in their thinking. 
I love this quote. I'm reading a book, and I love this quote from Philip Yancey. It was in the book. He didn't write it, but it was a quote. How could telling people to be nice to one another get a man crucified? What government would execute Mr. Rogers or Captain Kangaroo? Please hear my heart. Please hear my heart. I'm all about being kind, sharing resources, physically taking care of people around me. But, but God is speaking to me, and it asked me the last couple weeks, are you compelled enough to speak the truth of who I am so they have an option, an option to receive that? Do you love them that much? Or are you too afraid of being shunned? Maybe not being the most popular person at school, at work, whatever. True love works for the best to the object of its affection. What's the best to the object of the person that I love? Evelyn, I want you to be reconciled to God. I want to spend eternity with you in his presence. And I love you enough that I want you to know that from here to there, okay? What God stirred in me personally was, does his word, does his teaching, does the truth of the gospel still amaze me? Does it still stir up belief and faith in my heart and my spirit? Or since I started this walk back in 19... It's just become who I am. I hope God's speaking to hearts, but, but quite honestly, this message is for me, and I, I've known it from the beginning. God has, has done a work in me in the last few weeks. Thanks a lot, Pastor Scott, by the way. And, and he's asked me, am I compelled? Am I compelled to share the gospel? And there, there may be some of you that have that same journey in your hearts, and that's great if you do. And there may be some, honestly, there may be some who, wow, I've never heard the gospel before. I've never understood that Christ Jesus was a gift from the Heavenly Father to come down and be the sacrificial, crucified Lamb of God to cover me my sin, by his righteousness so that I can be reconciled to God the Father and live in eternity with him. I've never understood that before. You mean all I have to do is accept that? Yeah. For those of you that are out there, maybe online, maybe in this room that have just never even made that decision, yeah, that's all you have to do. Receive that gift Tell somebody around you that you did and and watch that growth process start to happen. That maturing process start to happen. In conclusion, I want to read a a verse. I'd like to say that, you know, God just revealed this to me. Well, he did. He revealed it to me through Pastor Scott. Pastor Scott said this would be a great verse to include in your message, and I agree. So much so that I'm going to end the message with it. I was going to have everybody read it, but, but to me sometimes that comes across like I'm not really listening to it. So what I want to do instead is I want, I want you just to kind of center on, just center on God. Quiet your hearts. Just quiet your hearts. You can close your eyes if you want. You don't have to. But listen as I read this. 2 Corinthians 5, 14 through 20. For Christ's love compels us because we are convinced that one died for all. And he died for all that those who live should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died for them and was raised again. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. The old is gone, the new is here. But all this is from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry 
of reconciliation, which is God is reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting people's sins against them. And he has, listen, committed to me, to you, to us, the message of reconciliation, that we are therefore Christ's ambassadors, as though God were making his appeal through us. We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. If you haven't been reconciled to God today, I implore you. Be reconciled to God. Why wouldn't you? <laughs> I, just, I, I just don't understand. Why wouldn't you be reconciled to God? Why wouldn't you take, upon, take that gift that he's given you? I, I implore you to be reconciled with God. And I, am, I challenge us as a church to implore everyone that's in our space in some way, some form, some fashion to be reconciled to God. So, Father, we thank you. Father, I thank you because I, I know what you've done in my heart the last couple of weeks. And I thank you that your spirit works in us to stir up those good works that are within us. And I pray that as, as we go out of this building today that, that we would have a new sense of passion, a new sense of being compelled to share the truth of who you are. And Father, I also pray because I know <laughs> that some of the critique of my, my teaching and my preaching is I can come across a little harsh when I'm passionate. So Father, if that's happened, I pray that you would just quiet hearts as well. Let them know that I'm speaking to myself. I'm not meaning to be harsh, not at all meaning to be judgmental. So stir up, Father God, in me a new love for the truth of the gospel that I would be so compelled to present it in every opportunity I have that that's all that I could do in Jesus name Amen